Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Vels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in Tube Lab number 203, we're going to talk about whether you should couple or not couple. <laughs> now we're talking about amps here, of course. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Before we get into today's topic, we'd like to mention that a new video is up on our other channel, Melatone Amps, in which we talk about our new, or soon to be new, phono kit. Well, we have a successful prototype build. Finally. <laughs> Finally. We spent a lot of time on this. Yeah, well, we spent, I think we put six months into the original Universal uh, 6 or 12 SL7. I knew I was going to screw that up. <laughs> 6 or 12 SL7 preamp. Yeah. yeah. Phono so, preamp. Yeah, but it was well worth it. The, the payback... Payback or payoff? Payoff sonically was just stunning. Yeah, and we've adapted it now, so it'll be a nicer kit for the modern line. Although we, the prototype uh, is on our standard chassis. You're giving away the whole episode. <laughs> okay, all right. I won't say any more about it. We'll put a we'll put a link below so that you can find your way over to the other channel. Okay, so today we're talking about coupling capacitors, and it's basically a revisit, <clears throat> but it's going to be a revisit with a bit of a twist because we're going to look at. Um, some caps and we're also going to look at um, how they're installed in circuits and what to watch for. Um, so coupling caps are the most common way different stages of a tube amp are joined together and because they're directly in the signal path, let me repeat that, they're directly in the signal path, they can affect the final sound quality and it's important to use quality caps and to only use them when absolutely required. On the other hand, if you don't use one or you use one that doesn't meet your required specifications, you risk high voltage DC being present where it isn't safe. Or possibly creating a filter with them that uh, isn't going to give you an optimal output. Caution, improper use, or negating to use a coupling cap could lead to the, to the destruction of your equipment and or your death. Ask <laughs> us how we know. Not about the death part. No. <laughs> no, we actually were talking about this yesterday. We have, uh, we both have lab benches and um, we have standard procedures to maintain safety. And actually someday... Uh, soon we should do another safety show. I think I did one years ago, um, but it's always worthwhile um, showing standard procedures. And uh, basically, uh, we make sure that whatever piece of equipment that we're testing or working on is safe. And yeah, we'll do an episode and show you how that's done. It's, it's pretty straightforward. And almost everybody's lab bench will have a very similar procedure. Now, Let's just take a quick look at some coupling caps. So this is actually going to be a, a cap that we're going to be using in a new kit amp. Uh, we haven't talked about it yet. It's going to be a new headphone kit amp. Um, but we have so much stuff in development that we'll, we'll wait for a little while. It's going to have to wait its turn. <laughs> it's going to wait its turn. So every cap is going to tell you the capacitance. So this is 100 microfarad plus or minus 5%, that's very typical, and it's going to have a rating, and that's how much voltage you can apply to the cap. And in this case, it's 100 volts DC. If, if you were rating it for an AC application, you would reduce that by roughly 40%. So a 40% reduction would mean that this can handle roughly 60 volts AC. And um, because I'm always very careful about matching components, and this was actually a new type of coupling cap that we brought in. We brought in, I think, 10 of them to try them out. And coupling caps can be very expensive, and this is in, definitely in the affordable range. Uh, they, this one measured at 99.9 .9 microfarad on a high-quality tester, and uh, the rest of the specs looked really good, and the rest of the caps 
tested very tight. That's, so that's a good sign. It's a very good sign. But what's more important is that in circuit, in the prototype build of, of the new headphone kit app, it sounds absolutely amazing and it works just perfectly. So we still have to put some more time on them, but I'm quite happy with these. So this, this big yellow guy looks to me right away. I say, oh, that's a coupling capacitor. Another hint that it's a coupling capacitor is that it's not an electrolytic. There's no plus and minus. So you can put, uh, you can put this in circuit this way in and out, or you can turn it around. <laughs> yeah, so that's just called being non-polarized. It's non-polarized. It doesn't care which way it goes in the circuit. So actually, when we build, um, we put all our labels lined up. I mean, we're a little finicky, but ah, I don't nice. think the app sounds better with labels lined up. Yeah, it's nice to keep it clean. And technically, too, you can actually use electrolytics as coupling capacitors, but I don't believe they work quite as well as this type that are non-polarized. Here is a, a um, Solon black fast cap you can see there's the solon logo on it these are uh i would call them mid-priced uh in uh the audiophile um category of coupling caps uh they're all made in france same thing here 47 microfarad plus or minus five percent 250 let me get that right on the focal point 250 volts dc we even have a temperature on here and we have a code telling us exactly what this cap's made of. Basically, these are all uh, metalized film caps of some type. The, um, the, uh, the substrate that the cap is wound around uh, based on uh, will be a certain type of uh, an isolating film. Um, and if you look up the spec sheet or the data sheet for your particular line of capacitors, you can get all of that data. So, um, and here, these are a lot smaller. This is actually the same series of cap. This is a Solon black fast cap, but it's a lot lower value. So the big guy is 47 microfarad, 250 volts. Let's see if we can get that on camera there. Let's see if we got it. So that's 1.0 microfarad, 400 volts DC. And you might have noticed that when the capacitance goes down, the size of the cap goes down. And when it goes up, the size of the cap goes up. That's a general rule. There are some real boutique capacitors out there that are very expensive. They get huge. So you, you pretty much have to design the equipment so that there's so room. It'll fit. <laughs> so it'll fit. Uh, here's a Vichy. We use quite a few of the, of the black stolen caps in our, in our kits and prototype builds and we use quite a few of the vishes and they both fall in i would say the the mid uh price range so they're, they're not cheap but they're not expensive they're very affordable they're very available they're modern caps they're extremely well made they they sweep extremely well sonically they sound very very good yeah, you don't need to go out and buy extremely expensive capacitors to get great sound. It but, might have a small improvement, but it's not required. No. And here we have one micro zero, so one microfarad or 1.0 microfarad. The reason why they'll put the microfarad in between is to make sure that you don't miss the, the dot. 1.0 is easy to get confused with 10. This is a 250 volt cap. And this is the 1813 series, not to get too technical, but most caps will be a series cap. So this is called the black fast series caps. These are the 1813s. Here's another 1813. It's a lot smaller, but it's also a coupling capacitor. And it's also a Vichy in the 1813 series, and it's 100 nanofarads. So that is um, 0 0.1 microfarad. And... Um, yeah, so I think what we should do is jump into our most popular um, uh, kit preamp. Yeah, and that's the Universal 6 or 12 SN7. In fact, we just sold another one yesterday. And as soon as we're done filming, we'll be working on shipping it. <laughs> There's always something to do around here. So let's go, let's pause, and we'll reset, and we'll get the schematic out. Okay, so here is um, the preamp. Um, 
uh, schematic for the universal uh, pre, and let's just let's just follow the signal in. So this would be the RCA coming in, and almost every piece of gear is going to have some kind of a, a protection on the on the signal in. Now it may be an electronic protection device. To detect um, DC that shouldn't be there, or it may simply be a coupling cap. So here we have C1 1.1 microfarad 400 volts, and the signal lands on the grid of the first and only gain stage of the 6SN7. We couple it off of the plate, the high voltage side here, and C4, another 1.1 microfarad, and we have a cathode follower stage. This is a low impedance stage, and we couple it on the output at 2.2 microfarad. And we'll talk about each of these caps in turn so that you can understand what they're for. Now, you might think 400 volts is way too much on the input capacitor, and you'd be right. But we try and standardize cap values. So rather than use a smaller cap or a different cap, we just simply took the minimum required cap for C4 and just duplicated it over here. So that's the only reason why we have that much voltage. A 250 volt cap would be just fine here. So this is where you basically plug in to the universal preamp. And it could could be anything plugging into here. It could be a phono preamp, it could be a digital uh, DAC, um, it could be some sort of streaming device. Anything can go into this. Yeah. Now. Well, not anything, <laughs> but any source uh, piece of equipment, right? Everybody got that. Now, you, you might think, well, there's a dead end on the grid, right? The input grid doesn't go anywhere electrically. And on a simple triode like the 6SN7, well, it's not that simple because there's actually two tubes inside one envelope. <laughs> so it's a twin triode. But there are three electrodes. So there's the plate, which is high voltage. On our design, it's sitting at 175 volts. There is a cathode, which is, generally speaking, lower voltage in a voltage gain configuration, which is what this is. So it's 5.6 volts. And the last electrode is the grid, or the input grid. And it typically, it's not marked here, but it typically references at zero volts. And so you might think, why would we even need a coupling capacitor here? Well, what happens if we have a dead short or an arc in a defective tube? Or somebody plugs in the wrong tube, period, mm -hmm. into the octal socket. And a lot of tubes would fit in that socket. Yep. So and all of a sudden pin one is not what it's supposed to be. Let's say all of a sudden it becomes somehow high voltage or we're arcing or we we have a defective tube um, and all of a sudden we have high voltage here. So electricity doesn't care that we actually have drawn this schematically going this way, right? <laughs> this is the way the, the circuit works. It all goes this way, but electricity does not care. So um, whether we had AC on here present or DC present, it will back up and head this way if it's given half a chance. Yep. So what happens here is if we don't have C1, the initial coupling cap in circuit, and your previous stage doesn't have protection, so on, this is the output stage of this preamp, so we have a coupling cap and a big one at that on the output stage. And we'll talk about this at, when we get there. So our output of this preamp has protection from the high voltage that's present down here. So whatever this universal pre plugs into, nothing hopefully will ever get across this cap that's high voltage DC. Only the audio signal itself can cross the capacitor. And I think in our fundamentals, we forgot to mention that. So coupling, coupling capacitors block DC and allow the audio signal, which is alternating current or AC to pass, yeah? Yep. I think almost everybody knew that. So here's the problem. 
If we can, if we know for a fact that the equipment plugging in has a capacitor coupling over here, we don't need a second one over here. So long as we know that nobody is going to do anything crazy like, I don't know, figure out how to hotwire the output of a power amp onto this input stage or something like that. This is an RCA jack, but you know, um, people do some weird things. People do some weird things. Don't do weird things. Be careful, be cautious, be, be, be informed, be knowledgeable, and then bad things won't happen to your equipment. So if we don't know what, how the output stage of, of the signal source is outputting, and we're not sure about the quality of our voltage gain tube here, and we should be, but if we're not sure, we're probably going to want to make sure that this coupling cap is in circuit. If we're fairly sure that the, the source uh, input has a safety cap or a coupling cap on its output stage, and we only use quality tubes that are in good condition, then we can probably safely put the jumper in place. And what that does is it bypasses an entire capacitor stage and it gives us a very clean run onto the grid of the gain stage. And capacitors all color the sound. Now the ones that we put in our kits and our prototype builds are relatively neutral sounding but they all have a very small shift sonically. They're also very clean, clear sounding caps. And it's, you know, it's worth a little bit of extra money that we invest to put those in circuit. Let me repeat though what Charles mentioned. None of the cap capacitors in um, any of our kits are exotic. And I would say every single piece of equipment we've ever designed and built, including the prototypes, are all in the audiophile grade of Sonics. So, um, and of course we sweep um, uh, in great detail um, our equipment so we know what the signal in looks like we know what the signal out looks like we know what the distortion looks like and more importantly we spend hours listening yeah so i can tell the difference between our coupling caps but only just slightly um yeah. okay let's keep moving well we actually have one more thing that c1 this coupling cap does for us here uh -huh. and that is protect the grid of the first stage here from DC coming in from an incorrectly designed source. So if that source doesn't have a coupling cap on the output and it has DC coming out through there, what will happen is we'll greatly shift the bias on our tube and possibly get a runaway or an overcurrent event on it, which yeah. could kill the tube or, or maybe damage the amplifier. If you get a runaway, you could get a red plate and you could have some damage in your actual uh, yeah. circuit components could get damaged. Now, if things are working correctly, you should blow a fuse first, hopefully, if it was well designed. But, but in our experience, often a lot of damage will get done before that even happens. Yeah. And I've even seen amp smoke and the fuse is still in place. And the reason for that is that the draw just isn't large enough to pop the fuse. Mm -hmm. But it starts cooking components on the inside. Yeah. So the interstage coupling capacitor C4 here couples the gain stage with the cathode follower or low impedance output stage and we're coupling the high voltage here so we do have a preamp that has a direct couple interstage but that's fairly uncommon it requires um, careful engineering and uh, a tube that can handle it most importantly a tube that can handle it do not direct couple just any old tube in fact Unless you really know what you're doing, never direct couple a tube. Um, and even then, show extreme caution. Um, and have a nice supply of extra tubes on hand. <laughs> yeah, don't put your best one in when you're testing it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, here we have the audio signal having come into the first uh, stage fairly small. It inverts because we took it off the plate. It gets much larger now because we've we put a lot of gain on it. Now we couple through C4 here, and the AC signal will pass onto the grid of the cathode follower. This is the second half of the 6SN7, but not the high voltage DC. Now, 
Take a look at the rating of the cap. This is important. The cap's rated for 400 volts. We're going to have 175 volts here, and that's going to be the steady state voltage. When the amp's turned on, this will probably surge a little bit. I don't have the exact value, but probably something like 200, 225 volts. So that means that this cap has to be able to handle that momentary surge. So normally coupling caps have a fair amount of space or uh, extra room in their specifications, and that's important. Yeah, you don't want to uh, get anywhere close to that value because if you get a short across your cap, all these problems we've been talking about will happen. Yeah. Now, the value of the cap is a more complex discussion, but basically you need a value of the cap in the circuit that it's running in that will allow the entire audio band to clear cleanly without any chance of, of filtering it. So our standard um, design uh, preference is to go very wide band, so well outside of the audio band, if the circuit will function properly like that. So 1.1 microfarad is actually really a lot larger than it needed to be, but sonically it sounds amazing. And, um, and I th I've consistently shown that you can you can achieve better sonics with a wider band. So, and actually, we should do a shout out to Paul at PS Audio because he talked about this quite a few years ago. Um, and if you're interested in design notes and things of fun things, he does actually a daily blog. So, Paul at PS Audio, um, and he'll drop you an email into your inbox. And they're well, they're they're fun, they're interesting. It's just a short, you know. 30 second uh, uh, blog that you can just jump in and, and see what he's thinking about. And in many ways, they're like condensed tube labs, uh, but they're mostly solid state related. But anyways, I digress. So here we're taking a low impedance signal off the cathode. And even though our voltage is lower, it's still, still a lot of voltage. These are all DC voltage readings, yeah. And we're on our way out to the RCA junction, or jack here. And all of a sudden we've got a much higher uh, capacitance. We've got 2.2 microfarad. And you might say, well, why wouldn't you just put a 1.1 over here? Well, the reason is we don't know for sure what the stage, the next stage electronics are going to be like that it couples to. Remember, everything around a coupling capacitor uh, can potentially turn the capacitor into a filter. And we wanted to make sure that we had as wide a band available so that almost anything we plug into here will not end up turning this into a filter and cutting off part of the audio band. So again, this is much larger than it needs to be but it works just perfectly and, um, and it gives us that safety margin. Is there anything we didn't talk about, Charles? Oh, I think that's pretty much it. Yeah. So one of the interesting things that I've seen over the last, oh, quite a few years now is that people that don't design their own gear, um, and, um, don't build their own gear, uh, have, um, a tendency to take, um, take amps and preamps that they buy and upgrade them. And the first thing that they upgrade are the coupling capacitors. Now, there's absolutely nothing wrong with doing that. If you are very careful and you meet the specifications of the original capacitor and you do the work carefully. Um, but I would caution you about spending huge amounts of money on coupling capacitors. I think you could spend a fairly modest amount and do a good upgrade and uh, achieve the sonic nirvana that you're aiming for. Okay, so hopefully that helps you understand a little bit uh, more about uh, what coupling capacitors are, what they do, and the things that you really need to be careful about. Um, and Charles, you've got a couple of really nice tubes that you found. Let's yeah, okay, let's clear the deck and uh, we'll get them out here.
Okay, what did you find? I mean, you've been you've been cleaning up, and uh, <laughs> every time I'm down in the shop uh, cutting new plates for amplifiers or working on prototypes, you know, I have a lot of time waiting for these things to go on. So I've been going through um, through our stock of tubes and looking for things that are interesting. And lately, I've been finding some absolutely beautiful six v sixes. And we have a small number of these uh, vintage 6v6 types. This is a 6v6G, and don't let the label fool you. This was actually made by Kenrad, and this is actually a beautiful looking used tube. Look at that chrome on there. And this is the second version of the 6v6 that was ever made. So the original was just 6v6, and G just means that they put it inside of a glass bottle, as the original was inside a metal can. And these are just Beautiful vintage tubes. They're um, they're sought after by a lot of guitarists out there because you'd run a pair of these in a small amp. And uh, these aren't actually in the store yet, but I'm going to be going through our stock and I'll be updating our stock list. And of course, we're going to have to test these as well and get them matched up. But hopefully, we're going to have some more beautiful vintage 6v6s in there this weekend. Yeah, and they've got they're labeled for GM. That was general was and is General Motors. Yeah. And um, believe it or not, back in the day, uh, the most common power tube in a car or a truck radio was? 6v6. 6v6. So that's why you often see vintage 6v6s um, with uh, an auto manufacturer's logo on it. Yeah. Okay, what else came in? Well, not tubes, but actually some really high quality IEC cords. Let me just go grab them. So, when we sell kits, we actually sell them without IEC cords. Um, and the main reason for that, besides the fact that we're trying to save people a little bit of money, is, um, is we're trying to reduce e-waste. And a lot of people have good IEC cords lying around, so there's no need to, to have extra ones. <laughs> Everybody's got a box of junk wires sitting in their house somewhere, and this is probably the most common power cord ever used. Yeah, but lately I've been going through our uh, our cords that we have um, hanging in the labs and many of them are defective. They don't have very good contact fits here. And we've probably worn them out over time. And some of them I don't think were that well made to start with. And so I thought I think it's time that we find a manufacturer that makes really good quality IEC cords. And we found somebody we're buying direct, so these are not that expensive. And, um, and the, the manufacturer uses, a, um, uses a, what's called a, an extra fine stranded wire. So they're very, they have a nice amount of flexibility, even though they have a fairly uh, firm casing on them. So we have um, a, we actually have three grades. I didn't bring the third one out. We have a, a very light cord that has no ground connection. There's your ground lug. This is the this is the US or North American standard plug. And we only have these in this type of plug, unfortunately. We can't stock every version for around the world. Yeah, unless we get a lot of demand. Um, and this is the safety ground um, connection. And the IEC cords don't need this, generally speaking. There might be some exceptions, so um, always check uh, what your equipment requires. But all of the switch modes that we supply uh, only need um, a two-prong cord and a much lighter gauge. So we actually have those in the store, and we have them actually for around the world. But for uh, North America, this is uh, equivalent to a 16 gauge. It's actually 16 gauge plus, and um, it's a uh, a lot of wire these days is is all done metric. So this is 1.5 uh, millimeter squared, uh, three conductor wire, and this big beast here is um, is a 14 gauge. Um, Plus, so it's it's actually very close to 15 gauge, or 2.5 uh, millimeters squared, and it's basically the same construction, the same manufacturer, and um, they're both in the store. They're both very affordable. So if you do need a better quality um, IEC cord, uh, they're now in stock in the store, and um, and we're actually going to do an episode sometime in the future for TubeLab in which we talk about um, 
something that and most people don't spend any time thinking about or even talking about, and that is the uh, the, the house mains supply to your equipment, and that can make quite a difference. Um, so that, we'll do that in a future episode. Yeah, maybe we'll throw it up on the scope and show people what it actually looks like. <laughs> well, Not know. as clean as you would think. I don't know if it's, yeah, I guess we can put the, the mains in the lab on this. Yeah. yeah, we did that just the other day and it was shocking how bad it was. Um, but anyways, maybe we could go back to the climb a pole and get a camera set up so that we can do it. No, I don't that think so. That would be exciting. And I don't recommend that anybody do that ever. <laughs> anyways, if you stayed this long, uh, here's some discount codes to help you out. People have been grabbing a secret code that's really easy to figure out. And uh, we can reach almost everybody with $20 shipping around the world. The exception is if you're in a difficult to ship region, such as an island nation uh, or in the um, Far East. If that's the case, just give us a shout before you order and we'll make sure we can get to you. Figure, we'll figure something out. And if your order is $150 or more after the discount supply, the shipping's on us, folks. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Stay safe, everyone. And enjoy, hopefully, your last days of summer. <laughs>